Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Dawn Massa Stankavish. She is CIO and COO at Massa Products Corporation, where she leads a team with her father, Don Massa, who is president and CTO. Each generation at Massa has added a piece of themselves to the business. They work on electroacoustics um, and also ultrasonic sensors and many other applied acoustics products and services. Don, it is so wonderful to have you on the podcast to talk about how your corporation's innovation stories have changed since your founding. Um, is it in 1945? Is that right? Yes. Uh, thank you for having me. It's, I'm happy to be here. Yes, we were founded in 1945 by my grandfather, uh, Frank Massa, who was uh, also an industry pioneer for electroacoustics. Before he founded the company, uh, he, you know, he graduated from MIT Swope Fellow uh, with his master's degree, and then he went off uh, to work for Victor Talking Machine, which later became RCA v- Victor. Um, and while he was there, he developed a lot of the key innovations in sound, and he met um, Harold Olson, who he co-authored the very first uh, engineering textbook for uh, taking sound as as it's heard and applying it with engineering principles. So it's called Applied Acoustics. Um, so from there, they they developed a lot of the fundamentals in audio, um, from microphones and loudspeakers to um, different uh, military sound devices, uh, telephones for ships and, and things of that nature. Uh, and then when he left there, he ended up um, going out west to uh, Brush Development Center. Uh, and when he was in Brush Development, um, he was the head of engineering there. And he first was working primarily with things like radios for cars and um, pickups, audio pickups and things of that nature. Um, but then World War II started happening and he had already established himself as an engineer um, that is paramount in the design of, of all things acoustic. And a friend of his from um, his RCA days happened to be part of the Navy and asked him if he could help him out with something because they were trying to develop what is now called a hydrophone, but it wasn't called that then. Um, and my grandfather immediately knew how to make it so it would work underwater where this guy wasn't able to get it to, to work properly. So he told his friend he'd take a look at it, asked his friend to send it to him, um, went and talked to his boss at Brush. And he said, no, Frank, don't don't work for the Navy. You'll, you'll never get anywhere because it takes so long with contracts and all this. So my grandfather felt bad on his own time, redesigned the item and, and sent it back to his friend. So then time goes on and the war picking up. And as the war efforts were growing, the government cut off the um, the use of vacuum tubes by commercial industry. And that was a big component that was necessary uh, for all these, you know, developments that they were doing out of brush. And they were at the moment when they're trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, close shop. My grandfather got a phone call from his friend that said, hey, Frank, you know, your your now what we call a hydrophone works great, and he negotiated a multi million dollar contract over the phone. Went back to his boss and said, "You know what? Maybe it's time to work for the Navy." <laughs> <laughs> and when when he did that, they they um, they brush shifted gears and did a lot of the development of all the hydrophones and um, sonars used in World War II. And my grandfather was at the forefront of the, all that. Wow. So through all of that experience, he decided uh, that he wanted to start his own company. And um, so in 1945, that's clearly, you know, the after the war. But he, he was, his experience was as a developer, as one of the major um, people that helped redefine how sonar transducers are engineered and produced um, for for use by the Navy. And uh he took that skill set and he started out um, just consulting and he was still in Cleveland at that time. Um, so the company was founded in Cleveland. 
for five years, he, he was consulting um, and he had uh, different family members working for him and, fr- and, and friends that he knew through, um, you know, his his professional life. And when he was looking for a big enough place, because it was his dream to have a facility that he could not just design, but also um, incorporate all the lessons he's learned, including, you know, how how to produce something, um, a quality production piece. So he wanted a manufacturer, he wanted a big facility, and he needed to be able to have um, a test pond to do that. So he's looking around for a place where he could have his own test pond and he could have his own building. And um, he had family still back here in, in the Boston area. I said, why don't you come home? There's a lot of water around here. <laughs> so, so he did. He he and he bought the land and and he uh, built the building. And we have a, a test a test pond here. And we've been in this same building since 1950. So it's kind of a special year for us because uh, it's 75 years of yes. the the founding of the company, but it's 70 years at this location. Wow, incredible. I it's amazing to see how a, a business owner's journey begins, especially in the middle of a global crisis, uh, the way that it did for him. And you know, what's amazing to me about Massa and the kinds of sort of the history of what you've been able to impact, if it weren't for the innovations that your grandfather sparked, we would not have sound in movies the way that we understand it. We wouldn't have quality sound recordings and music and broadcasting, and it's why we also have advanced military sonars like what you described starting all the way back in World War II. That's an amazing amount of breadth in terms of where this company has made an impact. Yeah. So it's something that um, is is really important that is a part of our culture too. We There, there were things that were really um, key to him that were important, and he founded the business on those uh, values, if you will. So, you know, the the need to have a quality product, the need to um, understand something um, and think outside of the box are all all things that have always been important to Massa. And and the stories of the challenges um, have also been important. And and you mentioned the. The uh, the sound of movies. I didn't even talk about that. You know, when he was at RCA, that's when the Great Depression was was going on, and um, the only department that wasn't cut was his group because they were working on the uh, the sounds that was used for both recording and uh, recording the the audio for films. Um, and for the music industry. And then also it was the speakers that were put into the movie theaters. And that was one of the only affordable um, luxuries that anyone could afford during the Great Depression. So so it was a uh, it's interesting that even before our founding, um, in times where a lot of uh, difficulty was going on in the world, my grandfather was in the right place at the right time and had the creative thinking to be able to overcome um, challenges. And I feel like that aspect is still true for us today. Um, you know, and, and another thing, you know, he, he was born an Italian immigrant family in Boston and he learned English by going to school. And this was, you know, he was born in 1906. So he was in the North End. You know, he didn't pass the language of Italian down through the family, like a lot of families that um, have come after that era have, uh, because he he wanted to assimilate. And in fact, he was born Francisco Enrico Antonio Massa, but he changed his name to Frank, Frank Massa, because he wanted to be American. He wanted to be seen as um, somebody that could rise through his ideas, his thoughts, and his actions, and his his you know what he did. Um, and he he wanted to make himself opposed to be described or defined based on where he came from. We judge people by what they do, not not anything else. You know, it's it's it's. Can you do your job? Are you are you good at it? That's awesome. We we love we love our job, and we love to hire people that are really excellent and passionate about their jobs. I would love to know, that story is incredible. Could you share with us, as his granddaughter, when did you come to realize those 
aspects of his background and, and some of the the bias that he was positioned that he needed to overcome. Since it didn't come from him, it didn't come from stories that he passed down necessarily. At what point in your life did you realize, wow, he actually had this whole other challenge? I've never had the opportunity to ask him point blank. He, he died right before I turned 10. So it wasn't like, you know, I was at the level where I was having these kinds of conversations <laughs> with him. Sure. So if you were around today, I would actually, you know, love to hear um, a little bit more about what, what he actually experienced because I, I don't know anything about that. So, yeah. you know, it makes me wonder today, you know, in, in today's world. But at the same time, I love that, you know, by focusing on what's important, um, even at a time where, where there were a lot of people that would have wanted to keep him down and not have him um, do well, he he proved himself and he proved himself as an asset and he, he, he worked hard. And as a woman, and, you know, I've... I, I, I've experienced some strange things, you know, here and there. Sure. I've been, I've been to, I've been to uh, trade shows and I've been to meetings where um, people don't acknowledge that I might be the one in in charge or the the senior person in the room. Um, that I've experienced that, but I, I, it, it doesn't matter what those people think because the reality is what the reality is, and you know, it's just interesting. It's it's one of those side thoughts that. Um, you know, seems relevant of the times, but the message that he taught me is that it's just stay focused and do what you need to do. Absolutely. I would love to hear, you know, if we zoom ahead a little bit today, you're running the company with your father. Um, yes. Could you tell us a little bit about how each of you have added different strengths, different perspectives to the strategic directions of the company over the years? Yeah. So let me just start with the fact that um, my grandfather started mainly doing um, sonar transducers. Uh, as my father, um, before him, actually, his, his brother worked uh, here as uh, my uncle Frankie, but he died before I was born in a terrible accident. Um, so he also was an engineer and, and they did a lot of the sonar transducers. And then um, there was a period where the the business was um, not sold entirely, but partially sold where percentage ownership was owned by another company. And at that time, there were some things that weren't going on. So while my father was involved, he was, he was um, working here with my grandfather. And, and uh, when they didn't like what was going on, they decided, you know what, we're going to go off on our own and do things our way because you're starting to tear our company down and pull our name down with you. And we don't want that to happen. So they actually left this building that we're in now and went to Randolph for a little bit, started another company that was in parallel. It was still Massa. So it was, um, there were two Massas running at the same time with the slight difference in, in the name. And, uh, and then when the, the Massa division was not doing so well by the people that were running it, uh, my grandfather and my father still owned all the patents. So the people that were not doing well with the company and were screwing up, my they were starting to go bankrupt. And at the same time, they were guilty of patent infringement. So my dad and my grandfather sued them. <laughs> and at the time, it was kind of funny because they're like, yeah, sure, the old man and the young kid, they're going to run out and start their own company. Well, they did. They did well. They got a few deals that they were working on because people would rather go with them for their innovations and their ideas. And then these other people were ruining things. So my dad and my grandfather, won, kicked them out, came back to the building, and that's the birth of Massa Products Corporation. Wow. So um, it's always been Massa. It's always been my my family involved, but there was a small period where they overcame this big challenge. And right at that same time, that's when my, my father you know, became president. And he was um, very much involved with some of the big deals that we had at the time. And it's where we started to move away from just transducers and, and do a little bit more in systems. So a system is like when the transducers are, are paired with electronics to become more um, a more cohesive system. And sometimes that's a sensor, sometimes that's a, a, a whole array with the electronics and, and whatever. So one of the deals that they had that was um, his innovation was uh, 
the automatic bowling scoring system for AMF, where we we uh, designed that and manufactured it and outfitted oh. um, all of those bowling alleys. So it's hard to imagine um, that the same company that revolutionized sonar transducer design throughout, you know, uh, history also did bowling alleys and there was no scoring <laughs> system before us. We That's also, um, at the same time, uh, we had a design for the first um, ultrasonic intrusion alarm that didn't have any false alarms. So we were selling that at the same time. So those two things were pretty big that um, came out of that era. Um, and then that just led and grew to other things. Because once you open the door to doing a little bit more, you, you open yourself to, to business. And what's really interesting about that is that um, the, the spirit of innovation has been with us from the beginning. It's shifted a bit, but that's what innovation does. You know, we've always stayed strong with what our core capabilities are, um, but we've grown upon that so that what our core capabilities are have, have also grown. <laughs> yes, so, yes, exactly. Yes, yes. It's it's really, it's the incredible opportunity when you look at a company that's 75 years old is to see the places where you did pivot or expand um, exactly. the successes and, and also some of the, the lessons learned along the way. I think most companies that we see that are this, you know, that have as much history as Massa does, they do have moments of acquisition or transfer and moving back and... Um, yeah and pursuing certain new opportunities and then getting back to their roots. And it's, uh, it's fascinating. I would love to hear, do, do you tell quite a few internal stories of innovation uh, in terms of keeping that history and that, that institutional knowledge present with new employees? Yes. So that's, that's a huge piece. So let, let, let me just continue a little because where I was going with, yes, with, yes, with my answer, it totally ties into that because, you know, my dad brought in a lot more systems and then I came in, I actually, after I graduated from high school, I, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. I thought I knew, but I didn't. And I changed my major a few times and I studied lots of different things and all of those things I brought back here. And, um, I actually, after I graduated uh, in New Jersey I, from Fairleigh from Fairly Dickinson University with my master's in psychology, um, with a focus on systems dynamics, um, I had two children. I was home, and um, my dad was saying, "You know, it's a family company. Why don't you come and uh, you know join us?" on the board. So I was coming up for board meetings um, and I learned a lot. And I before that, I did study some engineering enough to know that I'm not an engineer, enough to know also what we can and cannot do and what things fit for our um, capabilities. And what I realized when I was on these on the board was that um, we had some problems here. And then I decided, you know what? There's also a lot of really special things here that I want to make sure I preserve. And um, I have two boys. They're they're both very science minded and creative. And I'm thinking, oh my god, these guys might grow up and be engineers, or uh, you know, they might complement each other the way my father and I complement each other. Where my dad's kind of like, um, you know, he's he's a brilliant scientist and gets really focused on whatever he's working on, um, but sometimes because he's so in the weeds as to what each program is, he he's not um, aligned with where where can the business go. And I realized, oh my gosh, that's my strength. <laughs> <laughs> so I came aboard and I started um, the company where it was. We had an, a management team in place that didn't quite understand innovation um, the way this company needed innovation to be understood. And what they did was they saw our past innovations as just being that, something that was in the past, opposed to something that is still the lifeblood and necessity for who we are. So their focus for how they wanted to have new innovations were more along the lines of Me Too products. And they'd look around to see what other people have and then say, okay, well, how can we make that better opposed to how can we go where no one's gone before? And I realized that, and I, I started working here, and I saw that even more and more and more. 
And then I also realized that there was a, a culture here that I knew from my growing up and my history with the company that was not what newer employees knew or experienced, but some of the long-term employees saw that that was what we used to have and no longer had. And it became a big problem. So we tried to focus on culture and, and train people because we're a family company and we care a lot about every employee and their families and everything. We never would want to harm you know anybody by letting them go without giving them a fair chance. So we really tried for about three years to pull these people up and get them in line with who we are, where we've come from, what we're capable of doing and where we would like to go. And they just couldn't, they weren't capable of understanding that. Um, and the culture here at that time was kind of tense and we weren't able to achieve things. And there was a lot of trouble between the departments opposed to having everybody cohesive and working together. And we decided, you know what, that's, we just can't do this anymore. And we, um, we let the two people go that were um, a big source of the, the problem. And as soon as we did that, we had put all our energy into culture up to that point. And then we realized, you know what, the culture corrected itself. People were automatically on board and things started to go smoother. And there were a few other people that were still here from, from that era and they naturally started to not be here anymore either and it it wasn't a bad thing it was a very healthy thing they some people left on their own some people were let go but it was for the for their happiness and for our health so what Mm -hmm. we found was by focusing on culture internally allows you to receive whatever business you have coming your way and on the horizon at the time we knew we had to clean house because we had a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities that we wanted to go after. And we knew we couldn't do that um, until making sure that we were strong enough internally to do so. So once we did that and we started going after a new business, um, everything started to kind of fall in place. And uh, we're very fortunate that we've got a really strong team here. We have a lot of people that um, have dedicated their entire professional lives to us. Also, you know, once once you set something in place, like with clarity and 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 goals, you find that thing, other things just start to happen that that fit that goal. It's it's really an amazing phenomenon. And if you if you read about you know other other people, and I'm sure you've interviewed several people that will tell you the same thing. Once you have that clarity, it's like you know what to do, and everything just happens. And that's not true for every detail, but you know for the big the big things where it matters, that's what we experienced and we just we had some people that used to work here that went off and did other things and then all of a sudden they came back <laughs> so we had we have people that are are so loyal and and so wonderful here and um we really have a happy environment we've changed the um layout of our engineering department we we made everything um stronger focus we started hiring co-ops again um and we really grew uh both from a uh, business standpoint and from an internal standpoint. Um, And now through the whole COVID craziness, we've had people that never worked remotely before working remote, but we know that everyone's doing what they need to be doing, where it would have been much harder to manage that if we had a different team. So we're very, very happy right now. We've been strong. We've been moving forward. We've been essential. We've been open this whole time. We've been putting um, more precautions in place for as far as safety and, you know, masks, cleaning surfaces, all of that stuff to make sure everybody's safe and and doing what they need to do. We've been in full production this entire time. And um, luckily, you know, no one's been, been sick either. And if anyone thought that they were, we would like go above and beyond to make sure like, well, why don't you take a couple days off, check with your doctor <laughs> and then yes, then come yes, back. Yes. And we've been very careful with all of that. And, and we've been very fortunate that we've, we've had no cases, thank God, up to this point. And I hope that we, yes, yes. we don't have any. So yes, it's, thank it's you. been a wild ride. 
Yes. Oh my goodness. So uh, th- there's so many different ways we could take the conversation from here, but I, I think what I most, first of all, thank you for all of your essential business during this crisis and um, the pandemic. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that everyone is healthy and safe and that you're able to implement new workflows and all of that. In terms of culture, I, I would love to hear your perspective. You know, where do you hear story play a role in the creation of an innovation culture? Because it sounds as though in this evolution of the company, more recently, as you've shifted the, the cultural dynamic, you've been able to create a culture that's much more open to thinking innovatively, especially not just in regard to in- incremental innovation or sort of copycat better, uh, you know, improvement style innovation, but but breakthrough as well. So could you tell Absolutely. us a little bit about story and the way that that's maybe played a role in um, creating an innovation? Yeah. Culture? So it's really, for me as third generation, I value everything that I've learned in my life and everything I've learned from my family. And I was taking a peek at at the company from many different perspectives. I I think back to being a child and and being a part of, you know, my family's different than a lot of families. Um, When we would have business dinners when I was a kid with, with certain um, people from the Navy, certain people that were our, um, our reps, from DC or, or other countries. We, we had all kinds of um, business dealings where sometimes it, the families would get also get involved. So we would go out to dinner and I would go, you know, as a kid um, or I'd join on a business trip and we would do some, you know, some of the stuff would be business and where I wouldn't be a part of, but then for the dinners, the families would always be a part of things. And whenever I asked any kind of question in my family, it wasn't like, you know, I was just a kid or shut out. They loved that. And my grandfather loved it. My father loved it. And they'd tell me anything I wanted to know at any time. And I was taught that my questions are meaningful and learning is important and who we are is important. They always had that inclusion before I could even realize that the importance of something like that. But I did realize that other families didn't have that same attitude because I saw it with friends and, and other, you know, um, other branches of the family where not everybody was, was always welcome at the, at when it was time for the adults to talk, <laughs> sometimes <laughs> the kids needed to go. Right. Sure, sure. So, so I feel like that was one perspective. Another perspective is as I grew up and tried these different things and, and then I was looking at the top level from the board, I had that perspective. And then I had the the perspective of an employee and I also had the perspective, okay, I'm third generation. Where do I want this to go? And it's kind of a culmination of all of those things that made me think, you know what? I understand the founder's mentality. Dad's still here. He understands that. And I had a lot of chats with him privately about how how I would like to see the company grow into the future. And I'd bounce those ideas off of him and he loved it. And he got all energized and excited. And my dad's in his seventies. He's still here, (laughs) you know? So every moment with him, I'm learning from him and it's so meaningful. And that's part of what happened to me when I was in, I was living in New Jersey when I was coming up for the board meetings. And when my firstborn was about, he graduated uh, kindergarten, was going to go into first grade. And that's when I said, you know what, it's time to move. And my husband started his own business, so it worked out perfectly. So he could do that from anywhere. And um, I I was like, I really want to, I really want this time. And it was a drive that I can't even explain. It was just something I had to do. And I've, I've loved every moment and every single thing that seemed unrelated started to pull into place. So all of my creativity in terms of, um, you know, I, I studied you know, art for a while. I did engineering for a while, and then I finished up with psychology. And then I went to um, Harvard for an executive class. I got a certificate in finance. So I, I have all of these little pieces that I use on a daily basis. So we look at things creatively here. I said I want to focus. You know, we built this business. Our founders' mentality is: it doesn't matter if there's something out there, we can go where no one else can go. We understand this core technology better than anybody. Nobody's designing transducers today the way we do. And nobody has the lineage that we have in terms of the founder of the field passed on his 
like a uh, almost like an apprentice would learn in the olden days, a, a craft, right? So yes. we have that cultivated here. We have over 165 U.S. patents. It's amazing. We we we're still adding to that number right now. Um, we're in in the process of two major commercial deals that are we're under MNDAs that are for breakthrough technologies, and when they are released. They're going to be co-branded with the Massasonic logo as well as um, our our customer and partners logo be on on their items that these things will be featured. So we're very excited for these upcoming things because they're very different fields and very different places than that ultrasonics have never gone before, um, and sonar and transducers and all of this. You know, so. We're we're super excited about the innovations, and we've been focusing on that since I've come back into the role, um, and really taking the company to a place where our team is strong. We love co-ops, uh, co-op students, um, because acoustic engineering, electroacoustic engineering, is not a common um, major. It does exist, right. but it's not something that um, you know the way we do things is different than how our competitors do things and there's so much that's here that we that we view as our IP and our knowledge and and we like to be able to have someone that has the basic engineering fundamentals that has the creative capability so that we can cultivate them to learn how we do things and we can then create new things and it's our whole team that's strong we have acoustic engineers we have production engineers we have electronic engineers and then we have a production line and we have, you know, the basic business people too. So. Wow. It's, you know, what I love is that, that story about how your grandfather and your father always pulled you into the business strategy conversations and made your questions feel valid. That seems to me like a, a powerful, you know, sort of lesson that you learned early in life, that the value that can come from that. And now you've instilled that in your culture and you've also, you know, trying to create structures like your co-op programs to continue to instill that. I, I know that's a lesson I will continue to take into my life as a mother, uh, but also as a mentor to, to other people who are looking to grow in their professional lives. So I'm grateful for that story that you shared and that vision of you uh, sitting in on those dinners and, and trying to, you know, really be part of the conversation. Yeah, it's it, it's one of those things that you don't realize when you're going through it, but you look back and you're like, wow, <laughs> yes. that's like learning a language, right? Yes. It's, it's um, you're learning it, but you don't realize it. It's not formal, but it, but it's it's a. I was taught how how to behave and how to talk with certain types of people from a very young age, where uh, other other people don't always get that type of an exposure. So I'm very grateful for that. Yes, definitely. Don, I'm so grateful that we've had this time to talk on the podcast. As we wrap up our conversation, I'd love to know if you have advice to innovators in, um, in sonic engineering or beyond, uh, you know, in terms of getting their big ideas across and, and helping to create good storytelling around their innovation work. Yeah, I think that what... I've learned is that um, the challenges that a company has to overcome are just as important to pass on as the successes. And it's really important to teach both because um, you need to have a business filled with people that truly believe in who you are, what you're capable of, and where you're going. And they need to be able to feel like they're a value-added member of the team. Because without that, you don't have innovation, you don't have growth, and you don't have success. And with that, you have you have everything that's wonderful. And you have people in a place that enjoy their job, they love their job, it doesn't feel like work, you have fun with everybody. While you know, there's challenging times, of course, and everybody has things about their job that might not be their favorite thing to do. But overall, you have longevity that way. You have loyalty that way. You have people who love what they do that way. And that's how you can get the best designs. And if you, if there is trouble in your story, if you go over, if there is a problem that happens with your, your group as you're learning something or trying to 
do an innovation, you fail, you have to process that failure properly so that people learn from it opposed to feel reprimanded by it or, or let go f- by it. You know, you don't, you don't want to fire somebody because they made a mistake. You want to, you want to learn from that. Obviously there's certain situations where you, you've given it your all and it's not the right fit and that's a different situation. Sure. Um, but you have to keep the, the company goals in line and your team engaged. And, and I think that that's what gives you, um, a, a, a setup, if you will, for success. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Don, so much for that advice. I think that's that's perfect. Thank you for being on the podcast. You can find out more about NASA at, is it M-A-S-S-A.com? Is that right? That's right. Wonderful. M-A-S-S-A.com. Perfect. Don, thank you so much. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking with you. It's a wonderful podcast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.